I'll talk for him. So, um, anyway, tonight we're going to talk about, I thought about two different titles for tonight's sermon. I thought about, let's talk about the 12 disciples. But the truth is, I'm not done studying. All right, and I got some really good stuff, some really good gossip on them. And I want to share it at the right time, and I'm still studying. But while I was studying for the 12 disciples and who they were, um, I came across this uh, fella sitting at the table that I, I grew to not really like. I, I, I couldn't believe um, he was even at the, at the table. And so I decided that the speech tonight would be about the betrayal at the table. All right? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So first I want to read um, from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, when, and listen to this. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, take pictures up there on the table, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, What? Surely you don't mean me, Jesus. It is one of the twelve, he replied. It is one of the twelve. Who dips his bread into the bowl with me? The Son of Man shall go just as it was written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better if he had not even been born. Whoa. Now this is some serious Jesus right here. You talk about somebody killing your party, all right, your little dinner party. Woo, Jesus just lit up the room with that statement, right? Um, so I'm going to ask you, is everybody welcome at your table? Yeah. Yeah. Are you sure? Everybody? What about somebody that don't look like you? What about somebody that votes a different way? What about somebody that has um, different body accessories than you? Were they allowed at your table? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. How about the homeless man on the street? See, all of a sudden things change. All of a sudden you're like, well, everybody but that guy. Right? And Jesus said that everybody, everybody is welcome at the table. Right? Yeah. Everybody, anybody, everybody. I mean, anybody in the world everybody. can come at the table. Right? Right. All right. So let's stop for a minute and let's think back to your very first birthday party. Do you remember the first killer birthday party that you had? All right, mine was at the skating rink, okay? I'm just not going to lie, it was really cool by then, okay? Leslie DeBree, she had the skating rink party. All right, but little Todd, my oldest son, I remember he had a Britney Spears birthday party. Now, before you go, before you go, Britney Spears, let me tell you, she was hot, okay? When she first rolled out, okay, at LAX, yeah, okay, when she first rolled out, she was the bomb. So here's Mama. I'm going to provide the best killer birthday party. As a matter of fact, this is not even a party anymore. This is a production. This is, you know, this is a Broadway spectacle I'm getting ready to throw for a little time. All right? This ain't no um, Ronald meets hamburger. All right? This ain't no French fry sharing, uh, cookie, animal cracker sharing party. All right? This is going to be a major party. Champagne? Well, maybe not champagne. <laughs> So I'm going to throw a killer birthday party, and it's so awesome that not even my cousins, not even my family can play the role of Rick and her two backup dancers, okay? I got to go to the ECU theater department, find the theater majors. Now, this is a true story. This is like, this is life as it always was. Okay. And I would hold auditions to play Britney and the two backup male dancers. All right, this is serious stuff. We had limousine, red carpet, we'd go pick them up, roll up the red carpet, I was dressed as the chauffeur, even though we wouldn't let me drive the thing, I'd sit in the passenger seat. But we rolled up to your house and picked everybody up. Britney showed up, she signed an autograph, she sang, bought her little microphone thing. These are real actors now. We rented the bar out downtown, my friend owned the club. So, she signed all the I mean, it was real, y'all. This was real. I sacrificed my cable bill to put through this party. Okay? I told, I told my friend MasterCard, I ain't got it this month. Okay? Because I'm throwing a Britney Spears birthday party. He didn't realize the sacrifices I was making to throw this table 
where everybody would sit down and share cake. So when it came down to the birthday list, I said, now, little Ty, who do you want to invite to the birthday party? I'm thinking everybody, right? Everybody. No. He has a list, and every day he thinks about this list. And one day I pick him up from school, and he goes, yeah, Mom, out there in the brickyard in that playground, yeah, he's going to cut him. He's going to cancel. Put an X by his name. He is not on the list. He is not coming to my birthday party. And I thought to myself, I don't think I'd probably be going to do the same thing. But I thought to myself, now here he is, hadn't paid one dollar for this <laughs> birthday party. And he's going to pick who could sit at this table. Right? He is picking and choosing. Society has allowed him to pick out who's the most popular to sit at that table that looks like him and plays with him on the playground. Well, our good Lord Savior doesn't do that, does it? He says everybody can come to the table. He can have prostitutes. He can have Pharisees. He can have um, thieves come sit at his table. He can have tax collectors come sit at his table. It didn't matter, right? These are just two of the 12 disciples. The other ten could not come. Okay. <laughs> Nor did I find the table. So, um, a, a lot of believers will say, when they have a strong opinion, oh yeah, everybody bel belongs to my table. Everybody can come see my table until they show up. And when they show up, you're like, no, baby, not, not, not this table. You go over that table. I think your friends will be hearing this. Isn't that the truth? You're all open and Christian like until they actually show up. And that's exactly what Jesus and God does. He goes, don't think that you're going to tell me who's allowed at the table. I sacrifice my life to provide the food and the bread on the table. Everybody's welcome to the table. Now, in biblical times, the table was very, very important. The father um, used the table to read scripture to his family. He shared the table to judge his atmosphere of his own family. He used the time to talk about things and instruct his family on what they were going to do. This meant a whole lot. And my little picture is going away. We don't know why. Okay. So these are the little guys at the table. These are two of the guys. Where'd he go? There he is. And that's the end of the book. No, I'm just kidding. That's Jesus. Um, and in biblical times, it was very, very important on who you shared a meal with. All right? To have a meal together said that you had commonality with each other. Um, and, you know, it's crazy because Jesus um, invited everybody to the table and he healed everybody. Now, let's think about that. He, you know, if I was Jesus, I'd be a little petty. And there would be a man up there in line and, and he'd be like, okay, I need you to heal my hand. No, what are you going to do with them hands after they healed? You can go back and steal from next. <laughs> right? <laughs> and Jesus, he would heal the blind who would never look at him. He would heal the hands that would never serve him. He would heal the legs of people that would walk away from him and never return. And he kept doing it over and over again. And we get caught up in the thing, well, if you don't treat me right, you can sit at my table and act right, you're not invited. No treat? That's The power of the table says a lot. Um, you know, every relationship that you've ever had started at the table. The guy invites you out to dinner and he said, so what do you like to do? The table is a very powerful thing. It's where we share, share a lot of things. Every marriage starts there. And you ain't with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. And then sometimes, you know, if you were to walk into a restaurant or sit down with someone at a table and the other people look at you, they'd be like, now what is she doing sitting with him? Huh. I, I, they just, you know, they're, they're opinionated and everything else. But Jesus is not. Um, and I challenge you, every time that you do come in here and whenever you go out in public, choose a table that you're not really familiar with the people at and get to know them because it's amazing what you can learn. We all share already a commonality. That was already discovered when we put the title on what tonight was, Beyond the Power. All right? 
And so I, I challenge you the next time that you come just to kind of sit um, with someone here. And so one person said, every person that you love, you will share a last moment with them. The problem is you don't know what that last moment will be. All right? And so I want to talk about this table up here. This is the famous picture I think my grandma's got one in the kitchen of the dining room, all that kind of thing. But I also want to show you, there's two more images of what these tables look like. That is not it, that is a black screen. side of the hostess. You are to choose the latter, most popular seat in the house. And that's all the way at the end until the hostess says, hey, now we come. Come on up here. Sit with me. All right. And until you're invited, you're supposed to be at the, you do not assume the role of where you're going to sit. And Peter, the most popular guy in the book, in the gospel, is sitting way over here. Right? And Jesus had the nerve, had the nerve to sit beside Jesus. Does anybody know who Jesus was? He was a painter? Like a tree. I thought we had a couple of And you know what? I, as I was studying this and why I changed it, is I could not in the life of me figure out who invited this dude? How did he get on the team? Who put him on the most important 12 of all the people following Jesus? Jews. <laughs> Did you invite him? I didn't invite him. I didn't invite him. <laughs> I didn't have a problem with Andrew. I get why he's on the list. Okay, one of y'all Andrew. Um, and I don't have a problem with Bartholomew. I mean, everybody needs somebody exotic on their team, right? Everybody needs an exotic man. And I don't have a problem with Matthew, but you better get your taxes together. Okay, because Matthew's coming. And I don't have a problem with Peter. You always need somebody crazy on your team. You know, Peter doesn't cut somebody's ear off, you know. I mean, he don't listen. He's always, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't even step that far. I overstep. But Judas? Really? I don't understand who invited this dude to the table. <laughs> It's a popular name just like Hitler. All right, Let, let's take a little roll call. Anybody in here know a Matt or a Matthew? Does anybody know a Matthew? Raise your hand. Woo, woo. All right, there you go. All right, there's your time to shine. Does anybody know a John or a John? I did not know that. Anybody know a Andrew? Andrew. No, Andrew? Anybody know a Peter? <laughs> All right, okay. Does anybody know a Jews besides the one in the Bible? Do you have any friends named Jews? No. Do not have any friends named Jews. That's not my lesson. Crazy girl. <laughs> 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 Can you imagine if, if you named your kid Judas and he went to school 
first day of school, the teacher's doing roll call in the kindergarten. And she goes, Jesus, I scare you. And he goes, yes, ma'am, that's me. She says, go to the principal's office. And she's like, what did I do? And she said, you were born. Just go out there.
get the blood. Anyway. <laughs> That's a trick question. Alright. But for those that did raise your hand, that means that you have a little bit of Judas in you that could, it could happen. It could come out. You're vulnerable and, and you can find opportunities. Right? You're trustworthy. And we said the trail comes from trust first. Right? It's kind of tricky. So be careful and don't ever say, oh, I would never do that. I would never be the least friend that did that. Because there could be a little part of you. And then you can just give the right opportunity. You could turn into our uh, Jesus. So here's Jesus. Who's out. Well, let's get uh, Jafar off. that he's going to have with these 12 people. These are his 12 homies, his 12 BFFs, his 12 uh, frequently dialed uh, phone numbers on his uh, iPhone. Okay? Um, these are the people he calls when he needs a ride, when he wants to go watch a movie. These are the 12. All right? And... Yes? Um, and so Jesus is sitting here and he makes that statement about he kills the dinner on that movie by saying, One of you will betray me. And every one of them says, Who, oh, me, Jesus? <laughs> now, if it were me, I would have been like, I knew it was Jafar. He looked funny when you kicked him. I don't even know how he got him with the tea. You couldn't look at him and tell him he was the one that was <laughs> but here it is, we're in the upper room, and they're sitting down eating. All right, so let me, let me just take a little spot at the table. All right, we're sitting down eating. Whew, got to adjust my pants on. Let's see. Y'all do it. I'm going to create this place. So what's up? We're all having a good time. No, I just want to talk to you. I love you. I love you. You are the 12th best friends I've ever had. And Peter, you know, it was kind of funny the other day when you were trying to walk on board. You know you can't swim. You got to keep your eyes on me. I told you you got to keep your eyes on me. And, and they're having a good time, and then he kills the move with that mark. Put it. And I'm just sitting here thinking, if I was here, and Jesus know, knows, he knew, he knew far in advance because he can see through you, he can see in advance, there is no timeline, he already knows the end when it's just the present for us. He knew this guy was a crazy person, Jafar, sitting at the table. Right? They get me invited to him. Me, I would have been like, alright, so what's up? All that I did for you, seriously? You gonna betray me? Are you just gonna do me like that? Are you serious right now? I'll tell you what, get your mess and get out of here. <laughs> That's what I would have done. But Jesus didn't. He pulled up his seat and sat beside the guy, having a great time, sharing a great meal, and said, Hey, you want some olives? He really said, Great. You want some olives? And they ate from the same bowl. Now, could you have done that if someone you knew was getting ready to betray you? No. Everybody's welcome at the table. We're not taking sides. It's 
not about who you vote for, all that stuff. Um, I went so fast, I went through my notes. Um, okay, but let's talk about Judas's role. Of all the things, they gave Jesus the money back to hold. The betrayer, they allowed him to hold the money. Now, the disciples, they weren't poor. I don't know if you've ever had, gotten the impression that they were poor folk walking around, you know. They, they weren't. They, people were always tithing with them. Women would save money and give it to them when they would travel and do their ministries. They had money. And they had Judas hold the money back? He was double dipping. He put in 10 and take out 10. Put in 8, take out 4. Alright? He was stealing. He was a thief sitting there. And Jesus knew it the whole time. And sat there and ate dinner with him. Unbelievable. So the trail also has a trap. And for anyone who doesn't realize that Judas's heart is forming inside of you because it is happening in little increments. Little compromises. Um, and as I was even studying this, I even took a moment to step back and say, Oh gosh, Lord, do I have a Judas inside of me? Have I betrayed anyone in my past? Have I second guessed or did whatever was at the advantage of me? But what do you think made Judas do it? Was he jealous of Jesus? I don't think he was jealous. Was he greedy? Yeah, he was greedy. He was stealing money. But what's interesting um, is that when he went to the high priest to sell out Jesus, you know, because they were already going to, to arrest Jesus, they just didn't want to do it publicly and make a big snarl out of it. And so here was their opportunity. One of the 12 guys, this guy, Judas, went and sold him out. He was going to sell him out for no money in exchange. They just threw him in with 30 pieces of silver because they had already decided. Now, how, how, what, what are we going to do to get somebody to tell us where Jesus is? A private moment where we can go and arrest him and then drag him up here, make him tote his own cross, put a crown of thorns on there, and then kill him. And the Jews like, I, I'm your guy. After he sat there and was like, oh, Lord, I would never betray you. He sold him out. And, you know, the whole time, Judas' problem was he was disappointed, really. Um, I, I think that's probably what the problem was. For three years, this guy had dropped everything that he was doing and decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus kept talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And the whole time, Judas was like, oh, what? I got a shot for a road. Am I going to sell him the left or right? I'm going to be in that big castle with you. And see, he was confused. And I think the whole time that the Lord was talking about the kingdom, he thought it was a real palace. And so what do you do when you're asking God for something and he doesn't do it the way that you thought he was going to do? And that's what happened to Judas. He thought he was going to set up in the kingdom. He thought he was going to overturn the whole um, Roman government, okay, because nobody liked the government at the time. He, he wanted Jesus. Jesus kept talking about all these promises. But Jesus was talking about one thing. And Judas was hearing about the earthly things. And so when he disappointed him, and, and he said, what? You going to die? What? What, what we gonna do? Where's that palace? Where am I going to wear this robe? I got three robes in every collar. I got them well fitted. Got me crowns fit. What are you talking about? Kingdom of God. Where is that? He was disappointed. So what do you do when you get disappointed with God? When you've been praying for something, and it doesn't quite turn out the way you want it. You start losing a little bit of hope, a little bit of faith, and before you know it, Jesus crawls inside of you, and then you're like, God said, I gave up three years of my life. And maybe some of you said that about your man. <laughs> I gave him 12 years of my life, and where did he get it? Right? And now you hate him, right? And you stalk in his uh, Facebook page, right? Jesus, in little increments. Is getting inside. So, the devil wants nothing more than for you to say, how could you do this to me, Lord? How could he do that to me? How could he have cheated on me? How could, how could they have just left me? All alone. That's what the devil wants. He wants you to remember the Judas part of it. 
And Jesus is saying, I don't, I don't want you to be alone. And the enemy wants the pain of the betrayal of Judas to block you from the blessings of John that John's about to hand you. Do you know who John was? John was the only disciple that did not walk away from Jesus. John was the disciple who would lay down his head on Jesus' chest. Even Peter, his favorite, denied him. John was like a ride or die. Right? He was in it for the long haul. And on for the long haul. And the reason that um, he sat there beside of Jesus and allowed him to sit there was because he says, the reason I can forgive Judas is because I know that there's a Judas in everyone. Right? Because I know that the only one that is truly innocent, the only one that did no wrong, will still be able to say to Judas, so what you must, he, so Jesus looked at him at the table, and when they see, he said, when are you going to betray me? And they're all like, what? Not me? Not me? Um, he looked at Judas and said, do what you have to do, and do it quickly. So Judas was actually put there on purpose to help carry out what the gospel had said in the Old Testament. We needed Judas to be in that picture. Judas represents your everyday friend that you're hugging on Facebook and Instagram every day. And you got to find a way to let it go and forgive them and sit down at the table and not cuss them out and ask them to pick up all their mess and leave. That's, that's the true Christian. All right? 715. All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. There's still a seat at the table. Thank you that you didn't even have a table that is so inclusive that anyone can come. I pray that we don't miss out on the miracles of John because of the betrayal of Jesus. And thank you for that table being so long and so wide. Help heal the hearts that have been betrayed. And help us understand that we need to keep bringing more seats to the table. Help us not to judge and criticize and draw a line between everyone. But to offer them that seat at your table that you pay the price for. And love them anyway and always. And we thank you for everything. Amen. 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 All right. We're going to sing a song. Y'all want to sing a song? Yeah. All right. Let me have some music. And then, oh, you know what? It's 916. Should we move a rapper and announcements? And then end the song? Yeah, do that. Okay. Let's do that just in case. Let's do the rap. Do the raffle, you're all for the raffle. I got to do an real quick. So, you found my phone. So, um, Awaken Coffee is going to have.